Well, welcome everyone. Those of you uh, streaming by video, we want to welcome you to New Hope. We're glad that you're here. We're going to be talking about a new series called Your Turn. We talk about all kinds of sins and problems, and we say it's terrible, terrible that people do those things until it's our turn. When it's your turn, you think differently, rationalize it, and subtle deceptions enter in. I never thought it would happen to me. Uh, it will come your turn. Today we want to talk about subtle deceptions, but before we do, I want to tell you a story. story is told about a, a very elderly-looking man. And every night he'd sit on his porch on his rocking chair, rocking back and forth, but he'd have this big smile. Well, this lady in her nightly jaunts uh, walking down the street would, would witness him sitting on his rocking chair every night, just smiling away. Well, she wanted to know what the secret of this elderly man was for his vibrancy. And so one day she just walked right up to the porch and said, excuse me, I, I just have a question I'd like to ask you. He said, well, what's that? She said, well, what's the secret? What's your secret? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, I smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. I drink like a fish. I smoke weed, and I sin every chance I get. She said, you're kidding. She said, how old are you? He said, 26. <laughs> there are consequences. But the deception is to eradicate or hide those consequences. So we want to talk about subtle deceptions today and how those subtle deceptions apex when there are opportune moments. We want to talk about that. Every one of us will make hundreds of decisions every week, but not all the decisions you make will have the same weight attached to it. Some are very benign decisions. What shoes you're going to wear, what purse you're going to take, that's just for ladies, and, and what you're going to do here or there. But there are certain decisions that have your future tied to it, your destiny is tied to it, your birthright is tied to it. And those are very opportune moments, for good or for bad. You make the right decision, it will actually catapult you towards more of who God created you to be. You make the wrong decision, it sets you back. See, opportune moments can make you or break you. They can either solidify your call or it can dilute your call. It can build character or it can weaken your character. It can give you confidence. It can steal your confidence. Opportune moments. And it's at that moment the devil waits. We're, find out, we're going to find out about it through three people who met opportune moments. Two succeeded, one didn't. The first is Jesus. If you recall when he was tempted by the devil after having fasted for 40 days and the devil tempts him and he wins over that and it says and the devil waits for another opportune moment. He's waiting for those moments in your life that are opportune where the decision you make will either give you a future or take it away. Those are important moments. The second biblical character we want to visit with is Joseph. And the third, Joseph's uncle. Who's that? Esau. Well, let's start with Jesus. As we talk about opportune moments and how important it is, because there's going to come a day when it's your turn and you must choose well. You have to recognize them and choose well. Because the stakes are high and your destiny depends on it. Jesus is just baptized now in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And if you recall, a dove descended from heaven. And to that, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When he came up out of the water, a voice breaks the heavens. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now directly after he's baptized, we're going to read the scripture. So if all of our campuses would read it together, it's up on the screen. Would you read it with me? Go. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was... He was what? Now watch this. This is when the temptations come when you're hungry. You say, what? 
Yeah, you see the temptations become full-blown when you're hungry. Hungry for what? Hungry for attention. When you're hungry for romance. When you're hungry for prestige. When you're hungry for money. When you're hungry for power. It's an opportune moment. Choose well. After 40 days, he became hungry. Continue with me, go. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. Now, the devil's going to give him three temptations at this point. And every single one he'll overcome with three words. It is written. Listen carefully. If you don't know what the Bible says about your life and about certain issues, if you don't know what is written you will have no recourse against the enemy. He will eloquently baffle you. You'll need to know what is written. But if you don't know what is written or if you change what is written, you'll have no recourse on that opportune moment day. Because that's where he will throw an arsenal of temptation against you that you'll not be able to bear. Jesus says, it is written. After three of the temptations were put forth to him and he overcame them, let's read then what happens. Would you read it with me? Go. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune moment. And Jesus returned in the... He returned in the what? Say that again. The... Yeah. See, Jesus was led being full of the Holy Spirit. He returns in the power of the Spirit. Something changed from being Spirit-filled to being Spirit-empowered. Something happens in between. And he's going to go through some temptations. He stands on the Word of God. Now, there's a lot of people that I know that are full of the Spirit. You know, they sing a few songs, whoo, filled with the Spirit, whoo, yeah. But I know others that are empowered by the Spirit. It's very different. I know some that have all kinds, of, all kinds of Christian lingo, and they've got all of the best, but their lives fall apart. Their marriages are something not necessarily to be as an example. And their lives are fractured. But boy, they had the answers here. But there's a difference between just being full of the Spirit and being empowered by the Spirit. Something happens in between right here. And Jesus is going to example that to us. That gives him a power to overcome. Now, remember, you're going to have the greatest temptation when you're hungry. And so when your appetite gets big for romance, for attention, for prestige or influence, popularity, you are putting yourself into an opportune moment. The devil's been waiting for that. And some of the choices you make will have your, your eternity and your future attached to it. Because not every decision you make has the same weight. You've come away from conversations saying, why did I say that? Now look. Or why didn't I just keep my mouth shut? Why did I have to go there? Now I'm in the doghouse for a week with my wife. It, you, you can make certain responses that really messes up your future. Remember, an opportune moment can either make you or break you. It can give you hope or steal it. Strengthen your character or remove it. Give solidity to your call or dilute your call. Now, Jesus returns in the power of the Spirit. Why? Because you see, he was filled with the Spirit power of the Spirit. What happened in between? I'm going to put it up on the screen and you can just follow along, but listen to this. A person will never know the opportunity to know what true holiness is until they've also had the opportunity to be truly unholy. A person will never know the opportunity to know what true holiness is until they've also had the opportunity to be truly unholy. And have said no. And then they tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the time you understand the power of the Spirit. If you don't tap into it and you fall headlong, then that power can be available, but you'll never experience that because you didn't tap into it. 
You can have all the grace of God and the world available to you, but if you don't want it because you want to go another way, you'll never get a hold of it. You'll never experience it. You'll never know what it is to have the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, in an opportune moment, teaches us about being empowered by the Spirit because it's available. Well, on that, let's go to our next guest that we want to visit with. His name is Joseph. You've heard about him. At an early age, he was despised by his brothers. They were intimidated by him. He was too gifted. He had too many visions. He was weird. So they deprecated him. They pushed him away. They mocked him. In fact, on one trip, they beat the snot out of him. And then, just for good measure, they throw him in a pit and leave him to die in his own blood. Then they thought, ah, oh, we should get some profit out of this because if he dies, uh, we get nothing. And they saw a caravan of slave traders going to Egypt with some slaves from a foreign country. So they're on their way to take these slaves to an auction in Egypt. So they figured, why not sell him to these slave people, at least get some money. So they beat him up some more, sell him to these slave traders, get some money. Now, Joseph goes down to Egypt. He's put on the auction block, and a guy named Potiphar buys him. He's kind of like a governor of a small section of the city. Now, he must be really busy because he has a wife named Mrs. Potiphar. I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and she's hungry. Hungry for romance. And so she sees Joseph, a good-looking young man, and she's shapely, she's hot, she's young, and she's consenting. And so she kind of hooks him in and says, come on in to my bedroom. Well, instead of running into the bedroom, he takes off like a bullet, just whoosh. Well, she's so persistent, she runs after him. And she grabs him. He rips his coat as he runs off. And she has this piece of fabric in her hand. She's so mad that he rejected her she frames up this mock story that he tried to sexually assault her to her husband, gets him thrown in prison, but it won't be long before God's going to deliver him and put him on the throne of Egypt. It was an opportune moment, wasn't it? It could have gone the other way. Joseph could have said, you know, I'm tired of being a slave. I'm tired of my brothers telling me what to do. I'm tired of walking straight with God. It's time for me to party. <laughs> Come on, Mrs. Potiphar. <laughs> but he doesn't. Well, what if he did? I doubt it. If he did, I doubt it if he would have ever made it to the throne. I doubt it. But what if he would have asked God for forgiveness? God would have forgiven him. Oh, I'm sure he would. However, in order to become all that God created you to be, he's going to put you through some tests to test your integrity, to increase your faith, to build your character. Because remember, those opportune moments can either build character or steal it, give you integrity or take it away give you a hope or eradicate it. Opportune moments are incredibly important, but the devil waits for those opportune moments because that's when you're most vulnerable. Joseph fled. He took off. Do you know that the Bible says that? It says, flee from sin, young man. Flee. Now, don't dilly-dally. Don't just tiptoe through the tulips. Don't think it over. Don't experiment with it. Flee from it. Why? Because the Bible is saying that there is a sense of urgency at those moments. Why? Because your destiny is at stake. Your future, your testimony is at stake. Your confidence in yourself and in your faith is at stake. Win. Let me give you a more practical Example, let's say, lady, sister, you're at work and this tall, dark, handsome man starts paying attention to you. Tall, dark, and handsome. Not me, just someone of the same MO. <laughs> and, uh, but, but he starts paying attention to you and makes you feel young again, 
romantic again. Or you're a man, you're at work, and there's this young, shapely lady that thinks you're a hunk. She's sorely mistaken, but nevertheless, she thinks you're a hunk. I have one prophetic word for you today. You know what it is? Run! Don't think about it then. Just run and think about it later. No, I'm not kidding. Run and think about it later. Because you see, the first step to sin is not sin. You know what the first step is by the devil? Is consideration of sin. Think about it first. Just think about it. Think about it. Let me give you another practical example of this. Let's say you're on a strict diet and you're in Maui ready to fly back to Honolulu and you pass by the Krispy Kreme donut shop. Run! <laughs> Well, I just want to look. No, run! Well, I just want to look. If you look, it won't be 30 minutes before you have eaten a dozen and you got another dozen to go. No, you see, the first thing is the devil wants you just to think about it. Don't run, just think about it. Just consider it. Oh, you don't have to pay for this today. Just take the puppy home. Tell me tomorrow. You're done. You're done. Consider it. Just consider it. Well, I don't want to hook up with the lady. I just want to look. She's a good friend. No. Listen, God will give you the grace necessary when you cannot get away from these things. But he won't give you the grace to overcome when you can get away from these things. But you won't because you want to stay with it. And, and, and Joseph gives us the answer. He says, run. Now, we're going to come back to Joseph. But let's go to the third person here. And this one didn't fare well in his opportune moment. His name? Esau. See, the father's name was Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah. And Rebecca had twin boys. And the twin boys' names were Esau and Jacob. Now, because they were twins, Esau was like a minute older than Jacob. But nevertheless, he was the eldest. Now, Esau became a skilled hunter. Jacob, good cook. One day, after not getting anything hunting, Esau was starving. And as he was walking home, he uh, mm, smelt something really good on, on the oven. It was his brother Jacob making some stew, some lentil stew. And the seasoning was so good, he went to Jacob and said, Jacob, brother, I am famished. I am starving. Now, Jacob could have said, oh, you bet, brother, here. But you see the word Jacob actually means sneaky? And Jacob would not pass up an opportunity to take advantage of his brother. So he said, you know, we're twins, right? Yeah, yeah, and you're just like a minute older than I am. Uh-huh, yeah. So I tell you what, give me your birthright, because we're twins. I mean, like, we're the same, right? So you got the birthright, but give it to me. See, in those days, birthrights were very important. If you had the birthright, it meant, meant that you would have a double portion of everything that would be inherited. Everybody else would get one part, you get two. And you would get always the favored treatment. And you would always get free upgrades to first class. So this is a, the birthright. So Jacob said, trade me your birthright and I'll give you this food. Esau says, oh, I'm, I'm starving. What good is my birthright when I'm going to die? Well, of course he's not going to die. So he says, what good is my birthright to me? Yeah, all right, dad, take it. Who cares? Just give me that. Now, after having eaten this and he was a bit satisfied, he realized what he had done. And he thought, no way. 
He tries to get it back from his brother. But if you read in Hebrews 12, it says, even though he tried to seek to regain his birthright, he did not receive it, even though he sought it with tears. In other words, he said, Jacob, I can't do this. You, you promise. You have to go by your word. You don't want to be a man without integrity. We made a fair deal. Well, just give it. No, no, it's mine. No, I'm keeping it. And, and Esau got so infuriated that his brother would not relent. He plotted to murder his brother because the only way to get his birthright back is to not have a twin brother. So he decides, I'm going to kill him. And when he made that poor decision at this opportune moment, that moment had his future attached to it. And when he made a poor decision, it changed his life forever. Why? Let me tell you something else that causes opportune moments to arrive and materialize and the subtle deceptions just kind of get sucked in like a vacuum. And that is when you let your present appetite hold you hostage and make a decision for you that you know isn't right, but you do it anyway. Your appetite. When your appetite becomes stronger than anything else, the book of Proverbs says if you're a man of great appetites, Put a knife, as it were, to your throat. Stop, don't do it. Because as a man thinketh, so is he. What is he saying? He's saying, you're going to mess up your mind. You're going to think you have no consequences because it's not that big of a deal. It won't impact me. Your appetite's going to hold you hostage and you're going to make some decisions that give you temporary comfort. Yeah, but I'm famished. It's better to have a temporary discomfort then suffer a lifetime without the inheritance that you should have. I wonder, I wonder how many of us have forfeited portions of our birthright because we've let our appetites make decisions for us. I wonder. You say, what's your birthright? Your birthright is everything God planned for you from the beginning of time. Everything that God has in store for you, everything that God imagined for you, which would be your future, your legacy, your testimony, your faith story, the, the legacy that you'll leave to others who have been watching your life. Are you going to help them to find Christ or will you cause them a stumbling block because of the decisions we made in opportune moments? You see, not all decisions have the same weight to it. There are some decisions that have your eternity, your legacy, your testimony attached to it, and there's a bunch of people watching. Now, we all have appetites. But in the heat of the moment, you're going to have every voice say, it's okay, go for it. It doesn't impact you. It's not that big of a deal. Don't you dare listen to those lies because everything does depend on it opportune moments the devil waits for those because that's when he lays an onslaught of subtle deceptions on you because if you make the wrong decisions instead of giving you a future he can take it away but that's why the lord said of peter simon simon in luke 22 simon simon satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat but i prayed for you this is going to be an opportune moment i prayed for you that your faith not fail you can do it. And once you've turned and understand the power of the Spirit, strengthen your brothers. Your legacy will leave a trail for others to follow. It's a big moment. A big moment. But every voice is going to say, go for it. Because you see, the second step to subtle deception, the first is just think about it. Con consider. You don't have to buy now. Just consider it. Think about it. But the second thing is, is not only consider the devil comes in to, here it is, camouflage the consequences. Camouflage the consequences. That's no big deal. Everybody's doing it. Uh, everybody does it. It's not that big of a thing. And look at that. It's no problem. No problem. There's no consequences. 
It's not going to do me any good. You can have it. I wonder how many times we forfeited some of our birthright because we gave into these things during opportune moments. We have allowed our appetite. Don't believe the lies when people say it's not going to matter that much. Well, it did, because when he tried to get it back, he couldn't. Well, he's so infuriated that he plots to kill his brother. And he starts to get ready to do it. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you going to be a Joseph and do the right thing rather than the most comfortable thing? Or will you be an Esau and compromise? Take the easy way out. Let your appetite make the decision for you. You have a choice to make. You say, Wayne, what if I've already kind of messed up? <laughs> Here's some good news. Are you ready? Here's the good news. It's never too late because of Jesus to redeem your birthright. It's never too late. You see, because Jesus died on the cross, he gave us a second chance. How many of you are glad for the cross? He gives us a second chance. So what do we do? Here it is. Repent and return often. Repent and return often. Well, what if I messed up five times? And you repent five times. Well, I messed up so many times, God's not going to forgive me. Oh, sure he will. Don't believe that lie that he won't. Well, how many times will he forgive me? Seventy times seven. In other words, God's going to forgive you again and again to keep your heart sensitive to his ways. Because you know one of the worst things is? The worst things is, well, I've just messed up so, much, so many times. No use trying to ask God for forgiveness. I'll just, I'll just keep going. By the way, it's not even that bad because everybody's doing it. And you know, by the way, it's not really sin. It's... Um, it's the way we live now. And you know, it's not evil. It's um, our society. In fact, they passed the law that it's cool now. And so now we switch it from sin to cool. Let me tell you, the worst evil, the greatest evil of all is when evil is no longer evil. That's why it's important to repent often. Repent. Why? Because it keeps your heart in tune with what's right and what is wrong, determined by what it is written. The Bible says this in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. But before forgiveness happens, it says, if we what? Yeah, what if I don't confess my sin? What if I say it's not sin? Is there forgiveness for it? Yeah, it's not sin that will kill God's people. It's unresolved sin. Now, what I'm about to say might shock some of you, but I need you to listen. If you miss everything else, I want you to catch this. Every sin is forgivable because of the cross. Well, what if you're a murderer? Well, Moses was, and so was the Apostle Paul when his name was Saul. Uh, but, but what if you messed up like 10 times? Uh, that's forgivable. Every sin is forgivable. Every sin. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He died for how many sins? He died for all sins. You got it. Okay. Now watch this. But the Bible talks about an unforgivable sin. An unforgivable sin that will not be forgiven on earth or in heaven. What? Yeah, you, it's called different things, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But basically, here it is. It's called the unforgivable sin. Now, wait a minute. You just said all sins are forgivable. Yes, listen carefully. But there is an unforgivable sin that'll mess up your eternity. The only unforgivable sin is the sin you refuse to allow God to forgive because you don't ask him to. In fact, not only do I not ask God for forgiveness, I tenaciously hang on to it and start to defend it. Then even though it is written as sin, I don't think it's sin, so I don't need your forgiveness. So what happens? I carry around sin that's an unforgivable sin because I don't think it's sin. Now listen very carefully. Don't ever let 
people or society tell you what is sin or not sin. You let it is written tell you. Not right? Don't let the government tell you what's sin or not sin. You let God tell you what's sin. Don't let social media tell you what's sin or not sin. And by all means, don't let Miley Cyrus tell you what's sin and not sin. Don't let Lady Gaga tell you what's sin or not sin. In other words, don't let celebrities tell you what's sin and what's not sin. You let God's word because the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God abides forever. Forever. You're not going to stand before President Obama one day. You're not going to stand before the U.S. government one day. You're going to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and what he says goes. Yeah, but it wasn't illegal. Uh, who cares? <laughs> you see, don't let the state law tell you what's sin or not sin. You're not going to stand before the state law one day. And don't let the majority tell you what's sin or not sin. By the way, there's this humor story of Abraham Lincoln. He was trying to eradicate slavery, and there was this one man that was unpersuadable. Everybody wants to have slaves. No, 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 no. No, yeah, it's the majority. No, no, no. And he just couldn't persuade this guy. So finally he said, stop, stop, stop. Answer me this one question. The guy says, what? He says, how many legs does a cow have? The guy says, what? No, just answer it. How many legs does a cow have? Four, all right. The guy said, four. He said, okay. Uh, let's say that the tail is a leg as well. Now, how many legs does a cow have? That's where you're wrong. Just because people say it's a leg, it doesn't make it a leg. <laughs> it's what God created is what it is, not what people say it is. You get that? But yet we do that all the time. The majority says it's a leg. So it's a leg, isn't it? It's a tail. You see, don't let the majority tell you what sin is. That's why I come back to what Jesus did in his opportune moment. And he said, it is written. That's why I say, this is my Bible, the Word of God. And I boldly declare that this is the highest law in the land. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I do what it says I do, for I am a citizen of heaven. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. So don't let the devil camouflage consequences. Otherwise, we'll be like Proverbs 30 and verse 20, and it says this, it'll come up on the screen, but this is the way of an adulterous woman or an adulterous man. It says this, he or she eats and wipes their mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. See, the scripture even says this is going to happen in areas of, immor of immorality, and people will say, what's wrong with that? It's definitely wrong. Be careful because the devil's going to camouflage consequences so your appetite will get you to trade in your birthright. Well, let me bring it all to a close and wrap it up into a neat bow. Well, Jacob, who's now being uh, chased by Esau, hunted down he goes to a faraway country to live with his uncle Laban. There he meets Rachel and Leah, and they, get, they, have a, they have children. Now, God blesses Jacob so much that his flocks get so big that the land cannot sustain the amount of flocks that he has in, in the tens of thousands. Just huge. It's, it's a business. Well, one of the things that Jacob yearns to do is to go back home. One problem, in order to get home to Canaan, he has to go through his brother's property. 
called Edom. And if he goes through, the wound that may still be open might cause his brother to finally say, that's where you are, and end his life so that his brother Esau could get back the birthright that was stolen from him. Jacob so wants to go home, though, he gathers his flock and he starts moving forward, knowing that he's going to con be confronted by his brother Esau. So fearfully, but yet moving forward, he takes his flocks and then he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send hundreds of my flock in, in ahead, about a quarter mile ahead of me. This is going to be a gift to my brother because I know he's going to see us coming through. And so when they ask, who are you? Oh, by the way, this is a gift for Esau. Kind of like a peace treaty. So he sends a whole bunch, like five, six, eight hundred flocks up ahead. And then he's going to follow. Well, he gets into Edom and he looks and he sees his brother coming down the hill. Problem, his brother has 400 warriors with him. Oh no, he thinks, I am roadkill, I am history, I am done. So this is what he does. He quickly separates his family. He takes his servants, puts them in front. Takes Leah, one of his wives, and her children, puts them second, and then Rachel last, the one that he loves. Uh, that was his kind of his prized wife. Puts her in the back. And he says, in case my brother attacks, you guys can escape. Well, he runs up to the front and bows down, waiting probably for a beheading. Now, his brother comes with 400 warriors. His brother sees that that's my brother Jacob. He starts making a beeline to Jacob. And I could just see Jacob shaking knowing that his life is done. His family's on one side, watching all of this. Esau comes in it, and an opportune moment, he could have taken his revenge, could have taken out his knife and thrust it into the torso, thus completely eliminating the competition for the birthright, and it would return to him. But instead, when he noticed that it was his brother, he runs, listen to this, he runs to Jacob, throws his arms around him, hugs him, and weeps. All is forgiven. You're my brother. I could just feel Jacob, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> and his family, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Esau turns around and says, who are all these people? Esau says, it's my family. Now, in the third group, watching all of this drama unfold, was a little boy, his name, Joseph. See, Jacob had 12 sons. At this time, he had about 11. Joseph was one of them. Benjamin had not been born yet. And Joseph is watching this opportune moment where his uncle Esau should be killing his father, but instead watches Esau forgive his father. For by this time, he has heard the stories of how his father stole the birthright from uncle Esau. It's a known story by this time. But he watches his uncle in this opportune moment win. Now remember I said there's some decisions you and I make during opportune moments that have your destiny tied to it and your legacy tied to it. I want you now to fast forward the tape with me 20 more years because 20 years had passed when he went to Laban's house and now this happened. Fast forward 20 more years. Go back to where we started. Joseph is sold into Egypt wins over Potiphar's wife, gets ascend he is given the throne now. He's the second most powerful man in the known world. He's a pharaoh. A famine takes place. Joseph's own brothers come down from Canaan, remember the story, looking for food because they're hungry. Joseph recognizes them. It is now an opportune moment. He's pharaoh. He can take them out with one machete. He uses his trickery to get all of his brothers in. 
Learned that from his dad. Now all of his brothers are before him. And it's an opportune moment. He's Pharaoh. He can do anything he wants to. Do you remember what happens? He gets off the throne. And he puts his arms around them and weeps. I am Joseph, your brother. All is forgiven. I look at that. And I think, where did he learn that from? Uncle Esau. You see, in those opportune moments, it holds your legacy, your testimony, the pathway that you would leave for others who are watching you. And when Joseph gave forgiveness to those brothers, he didn't just save their lives, he saved the life of a whole nation called Israel. Because they then move into the land of Goshen, some years later, they go back into something called the Exodus and they form the nation of Israel. Rewind the tape, it goes back to a time where in an opportune moment, a young man won, not only with Potiphar's wife, but in this time where he could have slain them all. What you do in those moments, those opportune moments, have your eternity hooked to it, your legacies hooked to it, your testimony. And can I encourage you? It will be your turn. And it might happen today. It might happen tomorrow. But would you let God show you this is an opportune moment? And when you hit opportune moments, two people will be waiting for you. Number one, the devil with subtle deceptions. Number two, Jesus with the power of the Spirit. Choose wisely. I don't know what you'll choose, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say that with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say that again. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.